God D. Usopp has been slinging shots and predicting plots since he first began his journey to becoming a brave warrior of the sea. And although he is currently the most misunderstood straw hat, if you make it to the very end of this deep dive, I promise you I will prove that not only will Usopp soon become one of the most important characters in the entire series, but also how he is the straw hat you should be most afraid of fighting. There is a reason why Usopp has a smaller but but more diehard fan base than the more traditionally popular characters. Like Mason Loves One Piece, who asked for my Usopp victim video for, um, this many days. And so, here it is. To fully understand the complex nature of Usopp, we have to start all the way back in chapter 22, the beginning of the Surat Village arc. The newly formed Straw Hat crew arrived on the coast of Surat Village, where they are greeted by the fearsome Usopp pirates and their leader, the great Captain Usopp, who claims to have 80 million subordinates ready to defend his village. Luffy believes him and thinks it's awesome, but Nami calls his bluff. I think that this scene is such an amazing character introduction because you immediately get an understanding of the duality of Usopp's personality. Yes, he is lying and he is scared, but at the same time, he overcame his fears and is attempting to protect his village from a unknown pirate threat. Through a series of events, the Straw Hats get to know Usopp, leading them to visiting his friend Kaya's mansion in order to request a new ship. But they are caught during the discussion by her butler, Clahador, who begins disrespecting Usopp, calling him a liar and the son of a no good filthy pirate, which results in Usopp punching him right in the face. But after Kaya didn't have his back, Usopp leaves, swearing he'll never return. Usopp's resolve here really impressed the Straw Hats. But in retrospect, Clahador was baiting Usopp into a violent reaction in order to drive a wedge between his and Kaya's relationship. But it was still a satisfying punch. Nice. After this, Luffy tracks down Usopp and reveals that he actually knows Usopp's father, Yasop. And then by circumstance, they overhear Clahador's plans to murder Kaya for her inheritance. And that the butler was really Koro of the Black Cat Pirates, who had been deceiving Kaya for three years in order to get rich in an easier way than being a pirate and getting chased by Marines all the time. Kuro did notice Usopp, but he wasn't worried because he knew that no one would believe Usopp. The villagers were just too used to him lying all the time. Koro was right. Neither the town villagers nor Kaya believed him, leading to Usopp getting into a scuffle with some of the mansion guards. Usopp takes both of them out easily, showing that he is faster with his slingshot than they are with their pistols. But after Kaya still refuses to believe Usopp and even slaps him, he leaves the mansion grounds. Usopp is somewhat based on the fable The Boy Who Cried Wolf, even though he is a good person, no one believing him is a lot of his own fault. But it's important to understand, Usopp lies out of trauma. He was always saying the pirates are coming because he had always hoped that one day they would come and that his absentee father would be on their ship. After Usopp leaves the mansion, he runs back into the Straw Hats and his own crew. Usopp tells them that he lied about Kuro and the pirate invasion, but Luffy knows that him lying was in fact a lie. He had said this so that his crew would leave and be safe and he could take on the black cat pirates by himself. Knowing ironically that if he did succeed, everyone would think he is an even bigger liar than he actually was. But that's exactly how he wanted it. The village safe and him a liar. Luckily, the straw hats convinced him to let them help. Though things do go south at first. With them setting up their trap at the wrong coast, Luffy sprints off to the north coast to help fight the invading pirates. Usopp heads that way as well, but eventually everyone gets separated. Usopp is the first one to make it to the invasion because Zoro got dead dirty by Nami and Luffy got lost on his Zoro vibes. Usopp takes out a few of the black cat pirates immediately and then begins to tell his iconic, I have many subordinates lie. Then Nami shows up to protect her treasure and the two face off against the black cat pirates by themselves and are able to hold them off for a while before one of them is able to sneak up on Usopp, cracking his head open with a stone axe. But Usopp grabs 
grabs his leg and makes it absolutely clear that he won't let go. Nami saves him and the two are able to survive long enough for Luffy and Zoro to show up. Later, Usopp winds up saving Kaya from being killed by Koro. Then Luffy saves Usopp from being killed by Koro. While Koro is on the ground from Luffy's attack, the Usopp pirates pop out and get some wax in, trying to be brave and be of help to Usopp. But Usopp knows the cutthroat Koro will kill them for sure. So he convinces the kids to leave, but he said it in a way that made it sound like fleeing was brave by telling them that it's their job to go get Kaya to safety. This really impressed Zoro. Koro sends Jango after them, so Zoro and Usopp go after Jango, but by the time they arrive, Kaya had already signed her amended will and is about to be killed, but she is saved by Usopp's elite sniping skills. Catching Usopp is first major dub in the series. After all the Black Cat Pirates are defeated, Usopp convinces everyone who knows about the event to keep it a secret. Even though it would mean he remains a liar in the villagers' eyes, this allows them to continue to feel a sense of safety. Since pirate attacks on out-of-the-way villages like theirs are very rare, the arc ends with Usopp becoming the sniper of the Straw Hat Pirates. Usopp's first major solo fight as a member of the Straw Hats happens during the Arlong Park arc against Chu the Fishman. During the chaos of the Straw Hats helping Nami's home village rebel against the Arlong Pirates' subjugation of the East Blue Islands. In Chapter 83, Usopp blasts Chu in the face, but is spared his wrath when the villagers confront Chu. But before the Fishman can slaughter them, Usopp hits him again with his Firestar attack. Even though he is scared, Usopp wants to protect the villagers, so he yells, I'm your opponent, and leads Chu out to the forest away from the civilians. Usopp keeps running and eventually uses his ketchup star to fake being dead, fooling Chu into believing he had been hit by his attack and that the fight was over. So Chu begins to head back into the town. And being completely honest, at this moment, Usopp's cowardness had taken over. He even started rubbing himself with dirt to make it look like he put up a real fight. So everyone would think that he tried his best, but Chu was just too strong. As he was laying there and Chu was getting further away, Usopp recalls how hard everyone else is fighting. He realized how shameful he was being, so he got up and he screamed at Chu that this fight is not over. When the fight first started, Usopp does start getting beaten up pretty bad. Remember that the average fish man is 10 times stronger than a normal human, but eventually Usopp starts weaving his tricks into his fight. He fakes a rubber band attack and then busts a bottle of alcohol all over Chu, pissing him off even more. Usopp runs to hide behind some trees, so Chu begins blasting into the forest, pinning Usopp down. Until Usopp sees an opening and then shoots Chu with his Firestar attack. And thanks to Usopp setting up the first part of this attack previously by drenching Chu in that alcohol, Chu is straight up cooked in a blaze of fire. This was brutal. Chu attempts to put out the fire by jumping into a nearby pond, but Usopp then continuously beats him with Usopp's hammer to make sure he is finished off, earning him his first one-on-one -on -one W against a respectively strong opponent as a straw hat. When this fight first started, it looked like it would take a miracle for Usopp to beat Chu. But as you will see in this video, Usopp consistently pulls off miracles. The next arc that is instrumental to Usopp's character development is Little Garden. It is where both the giants and Elbath were first introduced, with both becoming mythicized by Usopp and fans alike. The giants' life philosophies embody Usopp's dream of becoming a great warrior of the sea. And although this has always been something he kind of wanted. He didn't have a tangible example of what this really meant until chapter 117. When Usopp would see the duel between Dorian Bragi and his face would light up from pure awe. Dorian Bragi are two pirates from Elbath that led the giant warrior pirates before they decided to stay behind on Little Garden 102 years before the Straw Hats ever arrived on the island. They had been battling over and over and over again every day since because of a reason they couldn't even even remember anymore. But out of respect for each other, they would never stop dueling until there was a clear winner. Just how far giants will go to uphold their warrior pride would be put on display when Baroque work agents would spike some ale with explosives that Dory ended up drinking, damaging his insides. But he would still head to his daily duel after seeing the signal that it was time for it to start. Out of warrior pride and pure respect for his opponent. During the fight, Mr. Three uses his wax powers to intervene even more. In their century-long battle, Dory 
and Bragi had 73,467 ties and only one victory. That was sadly tainted by deception. For a giant warrior, this is the worst thing that could ever happen for the loser and the winner. After Usopp discovers exactly who intervened with the giant's great battle, Usopp and BV attack the agents but can't overcome their unique powers. Eventually, Nami, BV, Zoro, and Bragi are all captured and were being tortured by Mr. Three. Being the badasses they are, Zoro and Bragi even decided to cut their limbs off in order to be able to get free and fight. But thankfully for Usopp, Luffy, and Karu appearing just in the nick of time, they didn't have to do that. In chapter 124, Usopp is the one that frees Luffy from his Golden Weeks mind control by using his Firestar attack to burn Luffy's shirt off that had her paint on it. This was really smart. Like you have seen and will see in the rest of this video, Usopp is always the one that saves the day anytime there is any weird powers involved. He is also the one that figures out the weaknesses behind Mr. Three's powers as well. That though it can harden like steel, it is still wax and can be melted. Usopp then conceives of a way to free everyone from Mr. Three's castle by using Karu to tie it with the oil soaked rope and having Luffy light it on fire. All in all, Usopp played the central role in freeing Zoro, Nami, BB, Dory, and Bragi from certain death. It was even said in story that the ones that were stuck on the castle had less than 30 seconds before their heart would have stopped. Chapter 128 is important because it's when Usopp promises Dory and Bragi that one day he will for sure go to Elbath. Really cementing the island's importance to Usopp's character development. As the Straw Hats sell away from Little Garden, Dory and Bragi ask for their trust. They say to keep on selling straight no matter what. So the Straw Hats are shocked and terrified when an enormous goldfish appears. Nami tells Usopp to turn the ship or they will die. But Usopp, who would usually be on Nami's side in a situation like this, tells her no and that they should have faith in the giant's words. And so he sells straight. As Dory and Bragi release Hakoku's sovereignty, which blasts straight through the island-sized goldfish, saving the crew and leaving them blown away by the giant's power. Let's fast forward to Alabasta, where Usopp becomes a victim himself. When he gets pieced up by a kung fu dung gong, which might be my favorite animal in One Piece. Later, Usopp and Kim will also get roughed up by Mr. Two. Remember, around this time in the story is where there was a huge jump in the power of the antagonist. Even Luffy lost a couple of times to Crocodile. After Mr. Two's encounter with Usopp, Mr. Two impersonates him in order to go capture Vivi. Usopp explains the situation to Sanji when he arrives. So Sanji goes after Mr. Two, which resulted in one of my favorite Sanji fights. Check out my Sanji's victim video after this one if you want to hear my full thoughts on that fight. Usopp then goes to help Chopper against Mr. Four and Miss Merry Christmas. This starts in chapter 183, and at first it's pretty brutal because of the really bizarre powers that all of the higher up Rogue Quark agents have, in which they are extremely efficient at using, especially in tandem with their partners. Usopp and Chopper faced off against a mole human and a guy who hits time release baseball bombs with his four ton bat. This is so dangerous because they explode even if they don't hit you, so he doesn't even have to be that accurate. Mr. Four also was assisted by his favorite gun, Lasso, who ate the mutt mutt fruit, which allowed it to become a living dog. Things for Usopp and Chopper were looking hopeless at first, but eventually Usopp creates an opening by jumping into the same tunnels Miss Merry Christmas has made, and then hopping out, hitting Mr. Four with his five ton hammer attack. Shocking Miss Merry Christmas that such a small kid could have that kind of power. Usopp declares himself the Destroyer King and proceeds to chase Miss Merry Christmas around trying to whack-a-mole her and then uses his legendary bluff hockey, scaring her into thinking that it was in fact him who had single-handedly taken down all the Baroque work agents that had been reported previously beaten. But after it's revealed that Usopp had been tricking her the whole time, Miss Merry Christmas gets pissed and attacks Usopp with her mole banana attack and then chases him with mole swimming. Usopp tries to trick her into hitting a wall, but it doesn't work. And he gets grabbed by her mole town highway attack, but he is saved when Chopper figures out a weakness in her fighting style, that all of her tunnels are connected and using the dog gun, he blows her up. Then in chapter 186, we get one of Usopp's greatest moments. Miss Merry Christmas tells Usopp that it is fitting that a feeble 
Marvel captain like he has would have a cowardly crew. Usopp stops running and asks, are you calling Luffy feeble? She goes on to tell him that Luffy has been killed by their boss and then laughs at the fact that Luffy ever dreamed of becoming the Pirate King. Usopp snaps and says, quote, Luffy couldn't have died. No way he'd lose to your old Sandcroc. Luffy's going to be king of the pirates someday. There's no way he'd die here. I love when any of the Straw Hats proclaim their faith in Luffy and his dream. Miss Merry Christmas tells Usopp, don't ever make a claim like that on the Grand Line. And that uppity upstart Luffy deserved to die. Usopp stands there with his broken, messed up body and yells to Chopper that there comes a time when a man even if he's up against the enemy he's scared to death of, when a man's gotta fight. Now, during the whole first part of Usopp's speech, they are legitimately trying to kill him, dragging him through walls, and then at full speed, Miss Merry Christmas drags Usopp into a full-powered, clean-up hitter attack from Mr. Four's bat. We literally see Usopp's skull and nose are shattered. Everyone thinks that Usopp is dead, but they are all stunned when the blood-drenched Usopp is still standing and finishes his speech. Referring to the time when a man's got to fight, Usopp says, and that's when somebody makes fun of their friend's dream. Woo! I mean it when I say this gave me chills. Even Miss Merry Christmas says that's impossible. You had your head cracked open with a four ton bat. No one should be able to survive that. Just to make sure y'all all understand, four tons is 8,000 pounds. That's double the weight of a large car. Usopp tells the assassins that Luffy's dream is the one thing he won't let them laugh at. They attempt to use the same combo attack against him again, but this time Usopp uses his smoke star to blind Mr. Four and then slips out of his shoes, which allows Chopper to propel Miss Merry Christmas forward, causing Mr. Four to smash her with the bat instead. Like a full-on home run obliterating hit. Super Smash Bros. finisher style. Game! Mr. Four becomes stunned at what he has done. So Usopp quickly uses Chopper's horns as a slingshot and finishes off Mr. Four with his killer Usopp's hammer shooting star. Simply fantastic. Nice. Some of my favorite W's in One Piece. During this battle, Usopp shows what it means to never give up and to never stop fighting for your friend's dreams. I know this fight doesn't get talked about that much, but I feel like it really embodies what One Piece is about. In Skypiea, Usopp fights against another god. And although he did get messed up by him a few times, so did everybody else. Enel was super overpowered at this point in the story. Even Luffy might have lost to him if he wasn't lucky made out of NL's power's natural elemental enemy. That being said, Usopp did still have a standout moment in the arc. In chapter 283, as afraid as he was, Usopp still found the courage to strike Enel with his exploding star attack in an attempt to save Nami. And of course, it wasn't enough to take Enel down, but it does cause enough chaos that Nami and Usopp are able to survive long enough for Sanji to make it to them. Sanji tells them to escape on the waiver, but Nami knows Sanji can't win either. And wants to turn around for him. But Usopp tells her not to, not because he doesn't care about Sanji, but because that would mean that Sanji's sacrifice was for nothing. Usopp was right. All three of them together could not have beaten Enel at this point in the story. And them escaping was how they could show Sanji the ultimate respect. Because if they all died here or even just got really hurt, Sanji was better off just not intervening in the first place. Usopp's warrior spirit allowed him to make the correct call. So we have made it to my favorite Usopp fight and the birth of who I call Batman D. Usopp. Chapter 332 is titled Luffy versus Usopp. And that's exactly what we get. In one corner, we have the rubbery Rocky. And in the other, we have his underdog opponent, Usopp with prep time. Not only is this one of the greatest moments in One Piece, but it's also one of the most heartbreaking. This whole situation started when Luffy told Usopp that he had made the decision to leave their ship to go and marry at Water 7, most likely to be dismantled, and that he would be getting a new ship to continue their adventures on. Because unfortunately, the go and marry had sustained too much damage on their previous adventures, and it just wasn't safe to travel on anymore via a diagnosis by the Galley Law ship rots. Usopp doesn't agree with this decision, as he feels he must care way more about the go and marry than the rest of the crew, because he would 
never agree to this, which though they do all love the ship very much, he is still probably kinda right. Usopp was the one to see the Clobbertermon and Skypea, and he has the closest ties to the ship's origins with his whole connection to Kaya. With so many emotions stirring inside of him, Usopp decides to leave the crew and challenge Luffy to a battle for the ownership of the Mary. At 10 o'clock that very night, Usopp explained that this wasn't just about the ship and that this is something that he had been thinking about for a while now, elaborating that things have changed since he first joined the crew and that the rest of them have just gotten too strong for him to keep up anymore, which I kind of get. I mean, Usopp, Luffy, and Sanji are straight up monsters. Remember, this is also on the back of Usopp getting the crew's money stolen that they needed to attempt to repair the ship in the first place. If one of the monster trio was holding the money, things might have gone differently. This whole conversation with all of the Straw Hats was just so intense and kind of painful to even see. Everyone was just so upset and unsure what the future holds for their crew. Nami tries her best to talk Luffy out of the fight, but Luffy says it's too late. It's happening. When 10 o'clock arrived, all of the spectating Straw Hats watched from the deck of the ship as Usopp arrives. Luffy says, you came and didn't lose your nerve. No matter what happens, don't regret this. You chose this fight. Usopp replies, darn straight, go ahead and try to kill me. I figured out how to beat you at your own game. Now keep in mind during this fight that Usopp only had a few unexpected hours of prep time to take on a 300 million berry opponent who on face value is dozens of times stronger than him. The aura surrounding them was so intense that Chopper asked if they can just stop the fight. But Zoro tells him that if you can't bear to watch, go to your room. Usopp kicks the fight off with a familiar lie, declaring that he has 8,000 henchmen just waiting for his signal to attack. Chopper falls for it, but Luffy surprisingly calls Cap. I say surprisingly because Luffy is often portrayed as the type to fall for stuff like this, but this time he knows Usopp too well. Or this means that every time Luffy acts all oblivious, he is putting on an act or just leaning into a good time. Let me know what you think in the comments. Luffy says, I know you don't have that many henchmen. Usopp then uses Usopp voodoo to summon gigantic razor blades between each and every tooth in Luffy's mouth. It also has no effect, but these things not working is all a part of Usopp's mind games. Luffy plunges forward to hit Usopp with a gum gum pistol, most likely in an attempt to finish the fight off fast, but Usopp begins to stumble onto the ground and starts coughing up blood, scaring Luffy into stopping right in front of him, in which we then learn that Usopp's blood was was one of his ketchup stars, giving the illusion that he had been gravely wounded from the Frankie family incident. This is the same trick that he used against Chu in Arlong Park, but remember, Luffy wasn't around to see it. So Usopp is able to catch Luffy off guard with a flash dial and then follows up with an egg star, splattering him with rotten eggs. Luffy tells Usopp to get serious and actually fight him. Usopp replies, this is how I fight, which is a pretty cold line because he is right. In an uphill battle with stakes, you have to do whatever it takes to win. Next, Usopp shoots a deluxe hot pepper star straight into Luffy's open mouth. This causes Luffy to breathe fire in pain. As Luffy steps back, he stumbles into another trap set by Usopp called Caltrop Hell. As Luffy is getting jabbed full of holes from the hundreds of Caltrops Usopp carefully placed all around him, the Straw Hats are shocked that Usopp is actually controlling the fight. They all thought Luffy would have won by now. Usopp declares that he will be beating Luffy and taking the going Mary as he launches dozens of shurikens at Luffy. All of these bladed and sharp weapons was a smart choice because they actually do real damage to Luffy's rubbery like body. The most badass part is all of this was just phase one to set up Usopp's real chain of attacks. Remember the stinky eggs that Luffy got hit with way earlier in the fight? That was so Usopp could mask the smell of gas that he was surrounding Luffy with. So next, when Usopp blasts the fire star at Luffy, it causes a massive explosion so big that it rocks the entire area. Now, the spectating straw hats are straight up flabbergasted. Luffy lay there for a little bit just thinking. He had taken some real damage, but he is able to get up. Usopp even says that he knows that's not enough to take Luffy out. When Luffy stands, he begins to take things serious and launches a full power gum gum gatling but Usopp shoots 
Ghost bursting Cactus Star into Luffy's fist, which explodes bladed quills, slicing Luffy up again. As Luffy attempts to dodge, Usopp doesn't let up for a second and begins letting off round after round of exploding star attacks. Luffy is straight up on the defensive, so he realizes he needs to turn things around and lands a solid gum gum bazooka on Usopp. But Usopp knew he'd do that. This is exactly what he wanted. He had been concealing an impact doll and uses it to absorb the impact from Luffy's attack and repelled Luffy with the force of his own attack amplified. When I first saw this, I did not see this coming. It was at this point as a viewer, I was like, oh my God, Usopp might win. Even Luffy was breathing heavy and was like, what is happening? Luffy knew that he had to end it because he couldn't risk Usopp having any more surprises for him. Luffy has a brief flashback to all the happy times they spent together and hits Usopp with the gum gum bullet ending the fight. And honestly, the impact dial hurts pretty bad whenever you use it like this. And Usopp still hadn't recovered from the Frankie family thrashing he took. This is one of the reasons Chopper was so worried about him fighting Luffy. So I don't think he could have lasted much longer anyway. After he won, Luffy falls to his knees in sadness. And as he gets up to leave, he tells Usopp that he can still do whatever he wants with the Go and Mary. But the rest of them are getting a new ship and they're sailing forward. His final words to Usopp was, so long Usopp, it's been fun. I feel like this entire sequence of events is so important because it changed the tone of the series. From Sanji kicking Luffy, Zoro's speech about how this isn't a pirate game they're playing and even threatening to leave the crew next himself to Usopp explaining his insecurities that he thinks about in his downtime. Oda was letting us know that the Straw Hat's personalities and relationships to each other are even more complex than what we see on screen. And that moving forward, if the Straw Hats want to survive, they have to lock in. Even though Usopp ultimately lost to Luffy, this fight showed how dangerous he can be whenever he takes a fight serious and overcomes his cowardliness. Usopp's preparation abilities for this fight kinda reminded me of this scene from the Justice League animated series, where Batman admits he has a contingency plan for how he would kill everyone one of his teammates, just in case there was ever a reason to. Usopp admitted he has been watching how Luffy fights, which makes me wonder, does Usopp have a contingency plan for the rest of the Straw Hats as well? Let me know in the comments if you think Usopp has a plan for how he would take down each Straw Hat. Either way, Batman Usopp walked so God Usopp could run on water. And as a devoted disciple and high ranking member of the Church of Usopp, he has blessed me with the power to make all of his loyal believers like this video and subscribe to this channel this is one of his heavenly commandments and a refusal to do so will be seen as a sin to his majesty join us and remember god usopp is always watching amen later in chapter 351 usopp briefly fights frankie for telling him to abandon the mary as well and attempting to dismantle it himself frankie eventually knocks usopp into the water which forced him to face the truth about how damaged the mary really was in chapter 3 68, a mysterious man named Sniper King takes Usopp's place since the Straw Hats were in dire need of a sniper with Usopp's absence. In chapter 384, Usopp befriends two giants named Kashi and Uimo, who he bonds with over their mutual friends Dory and Bragi. Usopp is the one that tells them they have been tricked by the world government into guarding the gates of justice for over 50 years, and he even eventually leads them into battle. But because the giants like Usopp so much, they tell him they will take him back to their homeland, the legendary warrior island of Elbaf. But Usopp replies that he isn't worthy yet, though this did continue the through line of Elbaf's importance to Usopp's character arc. In chapter 398, Sniper King shoots down and burns the world government's flag, making an enemy out of the entire world. In chapter 419, Sniper King blasts Spondum with a fire attack. This snipe was so far away that the Marines couldn't even locate him to even attempt to return fire. Sniper King takes out several more Marines just as easy saving Robin. This is a super underrated feat. Even when some of the Marines shot back at Sniper King's direction, their bullets couldn't even reach halfway to him. Usopp has saved many of the Straw Hats lives and I don't think he gets enough credit for it. Like how during Thriller Bark, if it wasn't for Usopp, none of them would have left that spooky island. It all started when Zoro, Frankie, Sanji, 
Sanji and Usopp would wind up in Perona the Ghost Princess's room, and all of them are immediately defeated by Perona's negative hollows. All but Usopp D. Him, who pretends that her attacks worked on him, but then hits some of her zombie bodyguards with his salt star, which releases their shadows. So why half of the Straw Hats are rolling around on the ground in full-blown depression, Usopp is taking on Perona, her ghost, and zombie solo. Thinking she must have missed her initial attack, Perona hits Usopp with another negative hollow, but again, no effect. She doesn't understand and asks how he defended himself, and Usopp responds confidently, I'm already extremely negative. This shocks her because no human has ever been immune to her negative hollows before. Because all people are supposed to be at least a little happy they're alive, hearing why her negative powers didn't work on him actually made Perona and her zombies worried about Usopp's mental health, and they kept trying to cheer Usopp up, which was one of the funniest bits in the entire arc. Usopp tells the rest of the crew to go save Nami and Brooke because they are useless against Perona. Perona hits Usopp with multiple negative hollows at once, but as the hollows exit Usopp's body, the ghosts themselves become depressed. Usopp out negative hockeyed the negative hollows, and even Perona was affected and apologizes depressingly to Kumsi. At one point, the zombie animals literally ask if Usopp is some kind of sage or saint, which was some nice foreshadowing by Oda for God Usopp, amen. After a while, Perona snaps back mentally and why Usopp Usopp is explaining how his awesome weapon works. She sneaks up behind him and then grows into her giant form. Usopp shoots at her, but she dodges by fluctuating her size and then sticks her hands in Usopp's chest, claiming she is going to slowly crush his heart. But after Usopp has a mini panic attack, she admits she can't actually do that. This made me realize how similar Usopp and Perona fight and act, tricks and messing with their opponent's minds. So forget the Zoro and Perona ship, let's start a truly cursed ship, Usopp and Perona. I can see it. Perona then reveals that her body isn't solid, so all of Usopp's attacks will just phase right through her. She asks what he plans to do now that he knows his attacks won't work on her. Usopp says, well, 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 at least that means you can't touch me either. Am I right or wrong? He was wrong. Perona blows up the wall next to him with her mini hollow and then continually attacks Usopp with them as well. Usopp attempts to run away after his firebird attack fails, but Perona can fly so she easily catches up to him and then makes him crash. Perona has several of her mini hollows attached to Usopp and then explodes them all at once. And then her Kumsi bear gets some smacks in as well and he is surprisingly strong. At this moment, Usopp really wanted to give up, but he realizes that if he loses to her, she will catch up to the others and wipe them out. Feeling like he needs a real hero, Usopp cries out for Sniper King to help, and he answers. Sniper King jumps up and shoves his hand in Kumsi's mouth, freeing his shadow. As they run away, Usopp and Sniper King have a discussion, which allows Usopp to figure out the trick to Perona's newfound confidence. He gets hit with some more of her mini hollow explosions, but while on the ground, he searches for and locates a room. He blows up the wall, exposing what he was searching for. Perona's real body. The one he has been fighting was Perona's astro projection. It can fly and transform sizes and even phase through anything, but while she is using this power, her real body can't move, meaning it is extremely vulnerable. Usopp shoots his big bang star at Perona's real body, scaring her, but she is relieved when he misses the shot. Usopp then gets halfway eaten by her special giant hollow, so that Perona has time to return to her real body to be able to to move slash protect it. She tells Usopp that it's too bad he messed up on that last shot because now he is about to die. But as she triggers the giant hollow explosion, Usopp nullifies it with a dial. This is when Perona notices she was a fool for thinking that the almighty sniping god could ever miss. Turns out that Usopp's original shot landed exactly where he wanted it to. And he was only pretending it was an explosion attack to trick Perona into returning to her real body, thinking it was in danger. The shot was actually his sticky star, which made it to where Perona couldn't move. By the way, I thought this was so funny because so many anime characters call out their attacks names before or as they are using them. All great fighters call out their finishing moves. 
No, they don't. And Usopp is the first one to realize that it's kind of dumb to give your opponent a heads up. He is like, yeah, mm, I'm gonna just lie about whatever attack I'm using, so I'll have the advantage. It's hockey genius. Anyway, so then Hippo Gentleman attempts to take Usopp out, but Usopp hits him with his impact dial that was loaded thanks to the explosion he absorbed earlier. Krona now is getting really scared, beginning to think she underestimated Usopp's raw power. Remember that most people in the One Piece world have no idea about dial technology. Usopp turns his attention back to Perona and hits her with his shiny black star, aka Roach Star. So she is now covered in roaches. This causes her to freak out because she has a phobia of them. So now she is covered in insects and unable to move and is terrified of Usopp's raw power, which is all a part of the show that Usopp is putting on to set up his finisher. So what does Usopp do next? He pulls out his 10 ton hammer and tells Perona that he is known as the strongest man in the East Blue. And because of Usopp's mind games, she believes him down to her core. Perona begs Usopp to stop and she promises she will never lay a finger on one of his friends again. Just please, no more roaches and no hammer. Usopp struggles but manages to lift the mighty hammer above his head. And he then brings it down with the wrath of the vengeful god of trickery he is. And as it makes contact with Perona's head, it pops the hammer, not her head. Psychologically breaking Perona's mind, she is now foaming at the mouth, blacked out, completely unconscious. Yup, it was a balloon hammer. The upgraded version of the hammer trick he used back in Alabasta. But thanks to Usopp laying the psychological groundwork with his series of mental traps, it doesn't matter it was fake. To Perona, it was real. As Usopp Usopp walks away the winner, he says, your mistake was to challenge me to a duel of negativity and trickery. Now, when we make it to the pre-time skip Saibaiodi Archipelago, all the Straw Hats pretty much get dominated. But Usopp does still have some brave moments, like him hitting a pacifista with his Atlas Comet attack to save Brooke. And he stood up to Admiral Kizaru in Chapter 511 trying to protect Zoro. But luckily for Kizaru, he is saved when Rayleigh shows up and to God Usopp allows him to fight Kizaru instead. Soon after this is when Kuma sends all the Straw Hats on their respective training endeavors. Usopp landed on the Boyne Archipelago, a chain of giant carnivorous plants disguised as islands. Specifically, he spent his time on the Greenstone Island, where he befriends Hercules and learns many things about this bizarre location. Like how it has a forest made of delicious food, called the Forest of gluttony. Let's just say that Usopp gained a little weight, but he eventually transformed it into muscle. There was also gigantic bugs and vicious man-eating plants. Living in this harsh environment for two years allowed Usopp to greatly improve his strength and agility. But the most useful development was Usopp discovering the unique biological properties of some of the island's plants, specifically what he called pop greens. Seeds that can grow into various full-size plants within an instance. Usopp uses these for his post-time skip special attacks. Some of them are pretty insane and incredibly useful. Besides combat, Usopp has used them to literally save the Straw Hat's lives. Like when he used a seaweed pop to stop the huge rocks from crushing the crew while they were 8,000 meters below the surface of the ocean. Usopp has always been the jack of all trades for the team, so these seeds fit him well. In chapter 646, the Straw Hats show off the fruits of their training and Usopp flexes his wide range of new attacks by easily trapping Daruma in his Green Star Human Drake, which is a human-shaped plant root which attacks anything that moves above them. Daruma then lands on Usopp's Green Star Trampulia and is finished off with his special attack, Impact Wolf, where the seed Usopp shoots transforms into a giant wolf that can shoot shockwaves from his nose. In Punk Hazard, Usopp's best moment was toward the end of the arc. When him and Nami declare bravely they'll take care of the enemies who have quote, lost the will to fight. Basically, Buffalo and Baby Five had grabbed Caesar and was trying to get away. Nami thunderbolts them and then Usopp uses his chomp grass to launch Meteor Swarm Assault. Caesar thinks he will be the one to easily survive the attack with his Logia powers, but of course, Usopp could considered that. So he hid some sea 
unleashed on chains and the debris that subdues Caesar. Although this was impressive, it's nothing compared to the iconic moments that awaited Usopp and Dressrosa, where Usopp has some of his highest highs and lowest lows. Dressrosa is one of the longest One Piece arcs, and since one of my next super videos requires me to do a deep dive into it, I'll try to keep it short here. Through a series of events, the Straw Hats get tangled up in a bunch of fights, drama, and a full-blown revolution that all revolve around the Don Coyote crime family, with the key ingredient to their crime stew being sugar. A devil fruit user with the power to turn anyone she touches into a toy slave. And then after their transformation, their entire existence is wiped from all people's memories. Yeah, it's some pretty dark stuff. Robin and Usopp are in charge of an operation that leads them to crossing paths with Sugar's party. And unfortunately, in chapter 740, Robin gets turned into one of the toy slaves, resulting in Usopp forgetting her. But this still leaves him with the responsibility of finishing off their important mission. However, without knowing his close friend is in danger, he now didn't have that extra motivation to overcome his cowardliness like he usually does. Usopp's fears of his friends being harmed is often what allows him to step up when he would rather step out of the situation. So in the face of almost certain death or at least enslavement, Usopp runs. In all honesty, this was one of Usopp's most shameful moments because though he did forget Robin, he still was abandoning all the Tantadas that truly believed in him. And he still had an understanding of how important the mission was to the liberation of Dressrosa. As Usopp is running away, he tries to justify abandoning the Tantadas to himself. But then he overhears the conversation between Treble and the Tantadas. Treble is making fun of their faith in Usopp by telling them that they were all lied to and how their hero won't come. And is probably sitting back laughing at how pitiful and foolish they are. But Leo and the others refuse to believe it. Leo tells Treble to shut up and the Tantadas declare that Uso Land would never lie to them. And if he insults the legendary hero's honor again, he will pay. Usopp starts having a mental breakdown listening to the Tantata screams because Treble was like literally stepping on him now. But the next thing we see is Usopp back at their location yelling, just stop it already. Usopp tells the Tantadas that he is no hero, but a pirate and nothing more. But that he doesn't want their death weighing on his conscience. So he would rather risk his life and go out with a bang. He says, quote, my name is Usopp. Remember that, Tantadas. And if I should die, build me a statue next to Nolan's because I'm about to become your legendary hero. Let's go. <laughs> Usopp and Treble engage in a battle, but because of Treble's unique and disgusting devil fruit, Usopp gets trapped in his snot. Sugar thinks this grape she took from Leo earlier is poison. So she is like, here, you can have your poison back and makes Usopp swallow it. But it was really just Usopp's demonically hot pepper mixture. It causes Usopp to make this scary, pain-riddled, fire-breathing face that terrifies Sugar, causing her to pass out, which was kind of the whole goal of the operation because her being unconscious results in all the toys being transformed back into humans. Some of them had been slaves for over 10 years. The mission was now a success, but Usopp had taken so much damage he couldn't move. And just to prove I can keep it real, I do consider this more of a lowercase w for Usopp, given how it went down. There are some One Piece fans that never forgave Usopp for his earlier cowardly actions, but I also have seen some good arguments that though this was a low point for Usopp, him forgetting Robin meant that with her absence in his life, all of Usopp's character development from Ennis Lobby was also gone as well, which was crucial to him learning to be more confident and brave. Let us know which side you fall on below. During chapter 744, as Robin fights off Treble and the Tantadas are trying to get Usopp to safety, Hardrudin the Giant picks up Usopp and says he must have fought really hard to save us if he's in this terrible condition. He tells everyone that has just been freed from slavery to look at Usopp because he is the reason they are all free. That Usopp put himself through hell for them and they owe him their lives. In that moment, Usopp became a hero to all the warriors present 
and I found it interesting. It was again a giant that respected Usopp the most. Hadruden yells, Captain Usopp. And at that exact moment, the roof caves in, allowing sunlight to peer through, illuminating Usopp with this heavenly aesthetic. All the warriors and civilians that were lucky enough to witness this holy event started crying in awe of God Usopp, amen, and said they felt like they were witnessing a miracle. Then after misinterpreting what Usopp was trying to say to them, they all commit to follow Usopp as their heavenly savior and begin chanting God Usopp, amen. A lot of Luffy's future Grand Fleet members were a part of this. And as a matter of fact, even prior to Usopp saving them, they said they would pledge their lives to Straw Hat if Usopp freed them. So it's fair to say that Usopp played a pivotal role in the formation of the Grand Fleet. Though these events are controversial in the One Piece fan base, one thing is for sure, Usopp managed to royally piss off Doflamingo to the point he was granted the highest bounty out of all the people Dofi wanted killed at a mind-blowing 500 million berries, more than Law, Zoro, and Luffy's. After a while, Sugar does wake up and she heads out to turn Luffy into a toy. When Usopp learns about Sugar's plan, he confesses that he got chills down his back when Whenever he realized that when Robin had become a toy, he actually did forget all about her. Usopp knew he had to save Luffy, but they had a problem. They were miles away from him. But Usopp wastes no time and locks in, deciding that means he just has to hit them from where they're standing. Kinemon tells Usopp that it's impossible to snipe Sugar from this distance. That not only can we barely even see the palace, but Sugar herself is beyond the palace walls completely completely out of sight. Usopp says, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't care about the details. I'm a sniper and backup is where I shine. He asks Viola to describe exactly what is going on in the palace, where Sugar is, the number of bars on the window, how tall she is, etc. He calculates all this and then he adjusts for the wind, knowing if he misses, he will forget Luffy forever. As he pulls back his super grown up great black Kabuto with immense concentration, Usopp unlocks locks observation hockey and he is able to see all of their spirits or auras through the wall. Usopp launches the super long range attack and right before Sugar turns Luffy into a toy, the same Usopp freakout face appears in front of Sugar, re-traumatizing her and knocks her out again. See what I mean? When one of the monster trio is your enemy, you leave beaten up. When you're on Usopp's bad side, you leave psychologically scarred. I think this was Oda's way of Usopp making up for how he acted previously because if he didn't save Luffy here, not only would the rebellion fail, but the Straw Hats adventure would have ended right then. In Wano, Usopp didn't have too many major fights, but he did have some very important moments if you know what to look for. Besides a few confrontations with Big Mom, he also fought to both Ulti and Page One with Nami's help. Nothing too serious, but I did think his firework flowers and its exploding pinecone attacks were really cool. Plus, he always took more damage than Nami during these encounters because he always tried to be the one in between her and the enemy. I felt like this was an overlooked detail and showed his bravery had increased since Dressrosa. It was thanks to Usopp that him, Nami, and Otama was able to escape page one. Then in chapter 1024, Usopp knocks out some fodder with his conqueror's hockey. But my absolute favorite Usopp Wano moment was when Usopp is fighting off all the beast pirates so he can protect Kinemon and Kiku, who were too hurt to move. Both of the samurai keep trying to convince Usopp to let them die because it's just part of their culture, since they aren't useful at this moment. This pisses Usopp off, and he gives an amazing speech. He tells them that dying with honor and slicing their bellies to take responsibility is straight up stupid, and he hates their culture for making them think it's okay. Usopp says, that even with snot dripping down his face, he will hold on to his life. Even if it's unsightly, he will live. Usopp has a flashback to Dress Rosa and his most shameful victory and says if he would have died for dignity 
back then, who would be here today to help you now? I literally got chills because I agree with everything he said. Also during this whole speech, he is just dropping beast pirates. And right before he is overtaken by the sheer number of them, Izo shows up and says they should listen to Usopp and just starts blasting every beast pirate in sight like some kind of anime John Wick. During his assault, Izo calls Usopp God Usopp and acknowledges him as king of the snipers. I thought this was such a cool way for Oda to let us know what Usopp's reputation is to the larger One Piece world, which is honestly kind of a beautiful thought. When Usopp eventually does return to Kaya, he will have real stories to tell her because he has become a proper adventurer. But then again, the more I think about it, Usopp has always been essential to the crew's success. He is a genius inventor, if not prodigy, who had no formal training and still managed to be a jack of all trades that filled several important crew roles at once for a large part of the Straw Hat's journey. He is the one who gave Nami a way to keep up with the crew's increasingly powerful enemies. He handled all the crew's initial maintenance before Frankie and still held down his main role as the crew's sniper. That being said, Usopp has had and does have flaws, but he is always trying to approve himself. To me, he is the most relatable straw hat. Usopp is a regular human trying to keep up with the monsters of his world. I just passed 20,000 subscribers and I'm so grateful and blown away by your support. But if I'm being honest, I still sometimes catch myself comparing my analytics to the monster channels in my niche. And I don't even know why. I think we all have a little Usopp in us, a little insecurities, but still a will to chase our dreams. So as we dive into the Egghead Island arc, I'm going to keep it 100% real with you. The only thing you really need to know about Egghead is that soon we are going to fucking Elbaf. Usopp's stocks are going to the moon and I'm all in, baby. Oda has been carefully crafting the perfect protagonist story for Usopp since he first made his appearance pledging to become a brave warrior of the sea. The Usopp supremacy movement is in full effect. So drop a men or a religious emoji in the comments if you're down with the Usopp agenda and to prove you made it to the very end of the Usopp video.